Good morning and welcome to Christ Church. We're so glad you could join us on this chilly October morning. Uh, if you wouldn't mind standing and let's pray as we go to the Lord this morning. Lord God, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you've made a way for us to be with you. We pray today that our hearts can be at peace, Lord God, as we come to seek your glory and lifting you up and praising you as you so deserve. We pray this in your name and everyone said, amen. Yeah. 
Lord God, we thank you that you have called us again, that you've made us on purpose with a purpose. We pray that our hearts be open for you this morning. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Hello, my name is Heather Hancock, and I am the Executive Director at Christ Church. Thank you for taking the time to participate in worship today. Hi, I'm Sandy Gregg, and I'm co-chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. October is Pastor Appreciation Month here at Christ Church, and we are blessed with amazing pastors that preach, teach, care, and lead us in living out our mission of building an inclusive community and sharing Christ's transforming love. Please take a moment sometime this month to thank them for their dedication and service to our church by talking to them after worship or sending an email or dropping them a note. Thank you. All Saints Weekend is November 4th and 5th. As part of our celebration, you are invited to honor any saint, living or dead, who has inspired you in your life. A white linen cloth will be set up in the community square during fellowship time or in the sanctuary during the week. Please write the names of your saints on the cloth, which will cover the communion table in the sanctuary during the coming year. A representative from the Nigeria Connection will be in the community square during fellowship time on October 15th, selling tickets for October 28th, St. Clair Bethel Rotary Chicken Barbecue Dinner. Ticket sales benefit the Nigeria Scholarship Fund. Pizza with the Pastor is Sunday, October 22nd at 1215 in the Otterbein Room. If you're newer to Christ Church, come and meet the pastors. Ask any questions you have about them or the church. Children are welcome to attend with their parents. Sign up is required at ChristUMC.net slash news. All women are invited to a Women's Interfaith Service Project Sunday, October 22nd from 2 to 4 p.m. Details and required sign up can be found at ChristUMC.net forward slash news. Hello, I'm Evan Ryle, the Christ Youth Director. I want to invite you and your family to Trunk or Treat on Saturday, October 28th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Everyone is invited to participate. Sign up to host a trunk or to bring your kids or grandkids to get treats. While you're here, enjoy lunch at the concession stand hosted by Christ Youth. This will be a great event. Invite your friends or your neighbors to participate. Sign ups required at ChristUMC.net slash news. Regular communication about worship and upcoming events is sent via email and text. You can find the links to sign up on the homepage of the website, ChristUMC.net, or call the church office and someone will be happy to assist you. Well, good morning again. My name is Matt. I'm the worship leader here. I get to worship every, uh, every Sunday, as God willing. <laughs> um, we're so glad that you've joined us here Hello, this morning. My name Whether is you're Hancock, here in this room or you're online, welcome Christ to Christ Church. If you're in this room, if you wouldn't mind grabbing the attendance pad, filling that out, uh, letting us know that you're in the room, and uh, passing it down to your neighbors so they can do the same. Uh, you'll find green prayer cards inside those attendance pads that you can fill out that our intercessory prayer team will pray over each and every prayer that's filled out and brought up to these baskets during the offering song. If you have any prayer concerns and you're online, you can click on the prayer request button there and the same intercessory prayer team uh, can pray over those prayers. If you are actually watching online and paying attention, then go to ChristUMC.net and click on the attendance button and let us know that you are online and paying attention. Um, and then if you have any prayer requests that happen during the week, anyone who is here present worshiping, then you can always come to the office if you have a prayer concern. Someone would be happy to pray with you that way, or you can call the office and a staff person would be happy to pray with you on the phone. There are many ways that we can all come together and pray through whatever it is that God's walking with you through in your life right now. Right now, why don't we stand up, say hello to a couple wonderful people, and uh, if you're in the online, say hello in the chat. So I'm going to read a brief call to worship here, 
It's from Psalm 150, which happens to be the last Psalm there. And uh, it says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has life and breath praise the Lord. So you'll notice in here, it doesn't say if you're awake on a Sunday morning and you feel like praising him, go ahead and praise him. Or, you know, if, if, you, had, if you had a good week, go ahead and praise the Lord. It's just telling us to praise the Lord. It's not giving us an option of where we're at. And as I've always said, despite our circumstances, God is still always good. He is still always faithful. So we're gonna be singing a new song this morning, which is also in the verse somewhere in the Bible, to sing a new song to the Lord. And we're using those words, let everything that has life and breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, all right? So let's try it together first, all right? So it's, it's call and response. These, these lovely ladies and, and Ryan are gonna help you here uh, as we go. So it's gonna go like this. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let praise everything that has, that has breath. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's how it goes, all right? We'll get it. We will. Oh. Put those hands together. Come on. Make some noise. Yeah. Hey. Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let
God, we praise you. Whether or not our circumstances, our emotions help us to do that. We look to you knowing that you are good, you are God, you are faithful, and you are always working. We love you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome again to worship. My name is Sean Lewis. I'm the creative arts pastor for our congregation. Um, as we come into a, an opportunity to join together in prayer, um, I'd remind you that uh, you can find green prayer cards in the uh, attendance pads at the center, or you can go to the church website, ChristUMC.net, and use the pray button um, to submit a prayer to our intercessory prayer team. Our intercessory prayer team is a group of individuals from our congregation that have uh, devoted themselves to raise the prayers of our community up to God. On your behalf, on the behalf of our, our whole church, um, and that act of intercessory prayer is a powerful connection that we can have with each other and with God. So during this next song, if you have a green prayer card, you can um, either bring it up here and submit it in these baskets, or um, as Matt said before, any time during the week, you, get, you can use the prayer button um, on the church website to um, offer a prayer uh, to God and, and to our intercessory prayer team to be lifted on your behalf. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, I thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to come together to praise you, to worship, to join in worship as a church and as a community. I thank you for the ways that you are working in each and every one of our hearts to see you, see your grace more clearly at work in our lives. God, this week we raise prayers of hurt, prayers of concern for our families, prayers of worry and concern for the world, prayers of rejoicing, prayers of new beginnings. God, we raise all of those to you, knowing that you receive and answer our prayers. God, we ask that you would just receive all of the prayers raised in this service and in all services this weekend at our church. And we ask that you would equip us, your people, to reach out and be a connection, be a moment of grace for those in our lives. Equip us to offer your peace and offer your words. God, we thank you for what it means to be your people. We thank you for the ways that you are working in our hearts. And we thank you most of all for the love and grace of your Son, who taught us to pray when we pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into a time in our worship where we receive our offering, um, in just a couple moments our ushers will come forward and um, pass a, a basket that you can offer, you can give your offering in, um, or if you're um, worshiping from home um, or online, you can participate in giving through the uh, Give button on the church website. Um, and know that our offering is an opportunity that we have to um, give back a portion of the blessing that God has so graciously given to us, and an opportunity for us to participate in the work and grace that God is uh, making known in our church and in our community. Let's pray a blessing over this offering. Holy God, I thank you for our opportunity to participate in your movement of grace. I ask that you would receive and bless this offering that we raise up today. Bless it so that it may become the work of your kingdom in this world. Amen. Doesn't mean easy, a life painless or without change. You promise you're with me from now to the end of my days. I'm never outside of your side, mountains, valleys that I face. Never outside. salvation no matter what tomorrow's bringing sing that with me and God is my hope and God is my salvation no matter what tomorrow's bringing Tomorrow's bringing, but I know the one who does. I'll face the storms because I know the one who does. Don't know what tomorrow's bringing, but I know the one who does. I'll face the storms because, yes, I know the one who does.
Lord God, we thank you so much that you care for us, that you are our hope no matter what is going on in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we can always look to you, remembering that you are our salvation and the one who is always there walking with us through whatever it is we're going through. We lift up our hearts. We open them for what you have for us this morning. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Today's scripture is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in their temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, this week as we continue in our sermon series, Questions of Faith, we're tackling the question, why the church? The book of Acts is a story about how the church began. It reminds us that, that we are part of that story. We are part of that faith that started way back in the beginning of Acts. It reminds us who we are and who we're supposed to be in Christ. And as witnesses for Jesus today, it's important that we don't let fear get in the way of sharing the love of Christ with the people that we meet and the people that God wants us to share that with. According to the author of Faith Working Through Love, he says the church is not just a voluntary gathering of like-minded persons or a civic-minded organization. It was instituted by God and is continuing the body of Christ in the world. Unfortunately, we live in a world that is in bad need of hope. And if we're being completely honest, just like the world, the church is also in need of that same hope and healing that the world is in need of. The problem is the church is supposed to be the one that helps bring that hope to the world. But how do we do that if we don't have hope ourselves? So the question becomes, why do we as followers of Christ and as the church lose hope just like the world does? I mean, shouldn't our relationship with Jesus allow us to have hope beyond hope? Well, in the book of Acts, we read about the qualities that characterized the early church. Things like awe and generosity and inclusivity and love. And as a church, if we're willing to express and live out those qualities today, then we can have the hope that is necessary to share with others. Our scripture this week from the book of Acts chapter 2 comes on the heels of Peter's sermon that he preached at Pentecost. He says Jesus is a new way. He preached about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He preached about Jesus' victory over death. He preached about Jesus' willingness to take on our sins and the evil of this world. He preached that Jesus died and rose from the dead to save us. His sermon was clearly inspirational because it led to the beginning of the church. Now, over the years, it seems like the church may have lost those characteristics of awe and generosity and inclusivity, and love. Those same characteristics that sparked the beginning of the church. It seems like we have now turned Jesus' resurrection into this one-time experience of getting saved to get to heaven. And unfortunately, that's where the power of the resurrection ends for so many people. Did Jesus Christ die to save us? Absolutely. But that doesn't start when we die it should start as soon as we receive what Christ did. Look at how the people of Acts responded once they got saved as Peter was preaching. It says right after they got to work, they addressed the real needs of the people. They saw what was going on in their communities. They saw what was going on in their towns and in their villages. And as a result of their generosity and their inclusivity and their love and their commitment to spiritual practices like worship, prayer, scripture reading, and fellowship, they experienced this awe and wonder that came from having faith in the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Wouldn't it be great to have a renewed sense of awe and wonder in the church? 
That's not very awe and wonder inspiring. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to have a new sense of awe and wonder in the church? Yeah. Right, right? The early church was full of awe and wonder because the early church, the people didn't have anything but to hold on to that faith in the resurrection of Jesus and see what the Holy Spirit was going to do. They didn't know how God was going to show up. They just believed God would show up. I wonder if we have that same kind of belief today. We don't know how God's going to show up. We just believe God is going to show up. I believe we lost some of that awe and wonder because we live in a world where we only follow the things that we can 100% prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. And as one author puts it, that makes faith a challenge. So actually witnessing people act on faith is increasingly rare. Too often the facts that we see erode the faith that we need. It happens every year in our church with the budget. Every year we sit down and we figure out based on your pledges, based on what you say you're going to give, and based on what we made the previous year, what we think might come in for the next year. And that's how we base our budget. This year, we decided to take a step of faith. We decided to base our budget on that number plus $75,000 because we believe that God was calling us to do some pretty exciting things. Now, as you can see in your bulletin, we're a little bit behind. That's okay, we got three months to make that up, and we're ahead of where we would have been if we had just gone with what we knew. There used to be a guy here by the name of Frank Schockweiler, and he'd sit in a finance meeting, and he'd say, you know, sometimes we just have to have faith that God's gonna meet the needs of the church. That's awe and wonder. That's that idea of trusting in God. But it isn't just about believing it's going to happen. If you look at the stories of the people in Scripture, people like Moses, Ruth, David, Peter, the Christians of the early church here in Acts chapter 2, it isn't just about believing that God is going to show up. It is about believing God is going to show up and then getting involved in the process. N.T. Wright talks about the job of Christians. He says, the vocation in question is that of being a genuine human being with genuinely human tasks to perform as part of the Creator's purpose for His world. The main task of this vocation is image-bearing, reflecting the Creator's wise stewardship into the world and reflecting the praises of all creation back to its Maker. That doesn't sound like something that happens when we die. That sounds like something that should happen right now, today. It sounds like something that should be actually awe-inspiring. We're to be image-bearers of Christ in this world. So my question is, are we awe-inspiring? You see, being an image-bearer begins when we're saved, but it definitely doesn't end there. I'm reminded of what Dr. Martin Luther King said about being saved. This is one of my favorite quotes of his. Any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually morbid religion awaiting burial. Talk about a challenge. I don't know about you. I don't want to be part of a religion that is just sitting back and awaiting burial. Experts who study the church talk about all the time how less and less people are attending church, especially mainline denominations like United Methodist. Experts list all kinds of reasons why this is, why this is the case. But before we start pointing fingers at what reason we think that people aren't coming to church is, we got to ask ourselves the same question. So as Christ followers, as members of Christ's church, are we living into the power of the resurrection and are we being image bearers for Christ or are we satisfied just celebrating the resurrection and waiting for heaven? Because if we become just satisfied in just celebrating the resurrection and waiting for heaven, it's no wonder people stop coming to church. Because We've simply become a religion that's awaiting burial, like Dr. King suggested. So how is Jesus' resurrection cause us to live like Jesus right now? What makes us as a church and as individual followers of Christ different than the world? What gives us the courage to share hope to the world so we don't become a church that's just awaiting burial? I mean, when you think about it, the quality of the church's life together is evidence for our belief in the resurrection. The greatest testimony of the resurrection is a group of people whose life together is radically different 
and changed than the world's way of community. There can be no explanation for how a church following the resurrection of Jesus is living other than the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, in the Articles of Religion of the Methodist Church, it says, the visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful persons in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments are duly administered according to Christ's ordinance. That's exactly what Danielle read about in Acts chapter 2. The believers' lives have been totally changed to the point that they had to have something happen in order them, for them to change how they lived their life. Nothing else makes any sense. For the believers in Acts, the resurrection was so much more than just a celebration. The resurrection was actually a way of life. As we read the stories of the Bible, my prayer is that we are challenged to allow the resurrection to change us, that we allow those stories to help make us image bearers for Christ in the here and now. We see in Acts chapter 2 that these believers listened to the apostles' teaching. They had fellowship and communion with each other in the breaking of bread, in prayer. It goes on to say that they, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as they had need. So when you put it together, the community life of the early church was made up of things like having unity of mind and heart, sharing their possessions the power and witness of the apostles to the resurrection of Jesus, and the grace of God which rested on them. The overarching concept of the early church was their unity, being in one heart and mind, in the fellowship of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, that Greek word is koinonia. It's often translated as fellowship, but it really means community. Community allowing the Holy Spirit to hold us together. We're being called to live in a new way, just like the early church. But in order for that to happen, it takes all of us participating in the church if we're going to experience community and awe like they did in the early church. That's going to allow us to make a difference in this world, and that's going to allow us to share the hope of Jesus, which we're going to talk about more next week. All too often, though, people's view of the church is a place where they go to be inspired and uplifted. And being inspired and uplifted is awesome. That should happen when you go to church. But if that doesn't translate into engagement and service, then it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's time for the church to move away from the question, how many people do we need to make something happen, and start answering the question, how many people can we mobilize to use the gifts God has given to them? That's what we should be about. But it takes all of us getting involved if we're going to share the hope of Jesus with the world. If we're living into our calling of building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love, and sharing the power of Christ's resurrection from the dead, and meeting the needs of the people around us, we're never going to have to worry about being a church that is just sitting back and awaiting burial. Instead, we're going to be a church that's full of life, just like the early church. But again, in order for that to happen, it takes all of us. And that's a big ask. But don't worry, the early church had some issues as they were trying to do this themselves. In fact, the community that the early church built was awesome, but unfortunately, initially, it was only for Jewish people. They didn't care about people beyond the Jewish community. In fact, as you read through the book of Acts, you see that God is constantly challenging them to, to kind of go out of their comfort zone. Who here likes to go out of their comfort zone? I don't see, maybe one. And that was a baby that I think was just stretching. <laughs> you see, as you read through the book of Acts, when you look at Acts chapter 10, and you read the story of Peter and Cornelius, who was a Gentile, or, or when you look at the story of the Jerusalem Council and the fact that they voted to let people become part of the community and not actually have to become cultural Jews, those are watershed moments in the early church. Both of those examples are instructive to us. We're called to be expansive in sharing God's love with more and more people, showing God's extreme hospitality to everyone that we meet as we continue living into our mission of building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Peter reminds us of that when he says in Acts 10, 34, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men and women from every nation who fear him and do what is right. As Methodists, 
we're all about grace. And pervenient grace is that first grace that shows that Jesus died for all of us, God loves all of us, and we all have access to God because God first loved us. But who can agree that we like to be in control? Much more hands than the previous question. We like to pin uh, labels on disagreeable opponents to us, right? We like to try to disenfranchise people who aren't like us. We see it all the time, liberal, conservative, straight, gay, Christian, non-Christian, male, female, black, white, married, divorced, clergy, laity, whatever. I could go on and on and on all day long. But what has become crystal clear to Peter and Acts, it should be crystal clear to all of us, is that to judge someone was not Peter's job, it is not our job, and it is not anyone else's job. It is God alone who judges the living and the dead. And remember, you never look at a person who Jesus didn't die for. God sent Jesus for every single person. That doesn't mean we have to condone or agree with everything they say or do, but it does mean we have to be willing to love everyone no matter what the differences may be. One of the most surprising features of the book of Acts is its diversity. Diversity of the people that God called other people to let in all of whom are symbolized by the uncircumcised Cornelius in Acts 10 and the vote of the people on the Jerusalem council in Acts 15. The writer of Acts is creating this scene where divisions are being broken down. People who were once at odds, Jew and Gentile, can now actually have dinner together in the same house, something Peter could never experience before now. God seems to be leading the people of Acts who would normally not interact to dialogue with each other. Why? Well, I believe it's because as they build relationships with other people, they're more likely to understand and accept who they are and to understand that they too are created in the image of God. And the same is true for us. One of the best ways we can show somebody the love of God is to sit down and enter into a conversation with them. But in order to do that, we can't attack others if they think differently than us but we need to be willing to listen to their viewpoint and vice versa. We live in a world right now where either people want to share their viewpoint in order to alienate everybody, or they're never going to share their viewpoint because it could alienate everybody. But that's not what we're called to be. If we're being honest with ourselves, I'm sure we're not in the same place now in our faith and in our walk with God as we were 10 or 20 years ago. Faith, when it comes down to it, is our attempt to keep up with the redemptive activity of God. Because we keep asking ourselves, what is God doing, and where on earth is God going now? The stories of Scripture that we read invite us to join in to this conversion. I looked up the definition of conversion. It is the act and process of converting or a state of being converted. Don't you love when you look up a word and the answer is in the definition? It is not helpful at all. So I did a little bit of a deeper dive, and I also found that it means a change in character, form, or function, or a spiritual change from sinfulness to righteousness, or a change in one's religion or political belief or viewpoint to another. Here's my favorite one that I found, a change of attitude, emotion, or viewpoint from one of indifference, disbelief, and antagonism to one of acceptance, faith, and enthusiastic support. That's the kind of conversion that brings hope to the hopeless. If the church is only about wholesale conversion of people by whatever method is most effective, then conversion has become the end of faith rather than its beginning. Conversion is a process. It is not just a moment. The modern evangelical notion that conversion is instantaneous and momentary is not what is happening in Acts. The book of Acts shows us that we never become too old or too adept at trying to be a Christian, that our life is exempt from more conversion or additional tuning. God is always working on us. Conversion in Acts are stories of beginnings, beginning of a new chapter in the life of the church, beginning of a new mission, beginning of a new life as an individual person. Conversion is the beginning of the Christian journey, not the destination. You see, the main business of the church was, of course, to witness for Jesus in both works and deeds. 
And as a result, we're told much grace was put upon them and more people were added to their number every single day. You see, the resurrection for us needs to become more than just a celebration of eternal life. It has to be a conversion to a new way to live life. It's time for the church and for us as followers of Christ to put our money where our mouth is. We need to care for those who can't care for themselves. We need to love those who other people see as unlovable. We need to forgive those who are hard to forgive. We need to open doors and continue to partner with other organizations that do the same thing. We need to treat others as true friends and not just people who need a handout. Community, praying together, breaking bread together, sharing resources with each other, and broadening who we let into the circle is definitely a new way to live. But it's what's necessary to effectively share the love of Christ with others. It's time for us as a church and for us as individuals to move past a religion that is awaiting burial, like Dr. King said, and be image bearers of the Christ that beat death. We must never forget it's because of Jesus' resurrection that not only can we have life, but everybody we meet can have life. To borrow a line from from one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption, and apply it to the church, when it comes right down to it, it's time to get busy living or get busy dying. Won't you join me as we get busy living and allow the resurrection of Christ to push us and challenge us to be image bearers of Christ every day, allowing us to live into our mission of building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful of the gift that you've given us of your son. Lord, as we receive that gift of grace, may we have that awe-inspiring moment because of what you've done in our life. And may we not just stop there and sit back and wait for us to get to heaven, but may we start living our life like you have come into it. May we start doing things that mimic you. May we show your love to the people that we meet every single day. And if we do that, it'll be awe-inspiring to the people of this world. And more and more people are going to be willing to receive the grace that you have made available through your son. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for giving us the courage to share that love with the people we meet. We ask all this in your son's name. And everyone said, amen. I want to invite you to rise and join us for our closing worship.
to God. If that's not awe-inspiring, I don't know what is. So as God brings awe into our life, may we share that awe with the people we meet outside of these walls so that they can experience the same love that they've experienced in God. Amen? Amen. Go in God's awe and wonder. <laughs>